Good morning, good morning. If you'll please stand as we begin our time. Morning, Jerry. We begin the season of Advent, uh, the theme of hope. We look forward to uh, what the birth of Christ means uh, individually and for the world. Uh, and we begin traditional Advent hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you, and I trust that you had a great Thanksgiving and uh, just a wonderful season to uh, reflect on all the blessings that God has given to us, and especially the blessing of His Son. And what a great way to begin Advent as we look ahead to celebration of the birth of Christ and, and uh, the redemption that He's provided for us in Him. Well, let me call your attention to a couple of announcements in the bulletin. Uh, first of all, you see the uh, insert about being a bell ringer. I know that this is, uh, there's a real need for this. Uh, there's a shortage of bell ringers. And so if you haven't signed up uh, for this, uh, let me encourage you to uh, think about doing that. Uh, this is a real ministry that uh, is having a real effect uh, on our community and and provides a great service to a number of folks. So if you can ring a bell and you can be a part of that, uh, please go ahead and sign up for that. A couple other announcements in the bulletin. Uh, you saw the uh, place for food in the foyer. Uh, this is part of ministry to Seneca Gardens apartment. And uh, you can see uh, that announcement there. But we are looking for more food uh, that we can hand out uh, at this Christmas season to those in the apartments there. Uh, this is a, one of the government subsidized apartments, and so uh, I encourage you to be a part of that. 
And then the other announcement I want to make, and mentions here about a prayer meeting uh, this coming Tuesday at 7 o'clock here in the church service. Uh, we used to do this on a, a weekly basis, uh, praying every Tuesday. Uh, but when our community group started, we said we'll pray in the community groups. But once a month, we'll have an opportunity for uh, the body to come together. And so I w just really encourage you to come and uh, be a part of a prayer time on Tuesday evening, a time that we can lift up not only personal needs, but the needs of the body, uh, the needs of the uh, church worldwide. And so uh, it's a wonderful time. Uh, I often think about uh, what I heard someone say at one point. It says, you know, the church so often sings the sweet hour of prayer, but avoids it like the plague. And, uh, and that is true. A lot of times we think, and we will admit that prayer really does work, and prayer changes things, but we really don't act like it so often. So I'd encourage you to come. I'd be a part of our prayer time uh, this coming Tuesday. Just something we're doing once a month, and it's just ask you to take an hour out of your month uh, to come and pray with us. Well, our call to worship uh, today, as in Psalm 130, says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his word I hope. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is a steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so grateful that we had the opportunity this morning to assemble in the name of Jesus and to come and offer to you sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. Lord, we are in awe of you, your greatness, your glory, the abundance of your mercy and grace that you've lavished upon us in Christ. Uh, Father, I pray today that as we worship you, uh, Lord, our hearts would be engaged. Uh, that our hearts would be filled with joy, your joy would be made full in our lives. Pray, Lord, that as we draw near to you, you would draw near to us. Uh, you would bless us with your presence. You would remind us that we are indeed loved by you, loved unconditionally, perfectly, loved as much as you love even your only beloved son, Jesus. Oh, Father, I pray that our hearts would be moved as a result of our time here together today, uh, Lord, we would uh, love you more with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Pray that you would work in our lives, that we would be transformed into the likeness of our Savior. So, Lord, would you bless all that we do here today. Uh, may the name of Jesus be lifted up, exalted in our midst. Father, we thank you in advance for what you have in store for us and all that you will do. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. If we'll please stand as we sing the joy, the hope that the Lord does hear our prayers from the depths of woe.
triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we do bless and adore you today. We confess that you are the only living and true God. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Lord, you're the one that spoke the worlds into existence. You're the one that upholds all things by the word of your power. Lord, what a great, mighty God you are. Now, Father, you're a God who has made amazing promises to us. Lord, thank you that your word has come to us. Thank you that you have spoken. You've revealed yourself to us. And you revealed your will for us. Lord, we thank you that your word is 
true and all the promises you've made uh, will be fulfilled. Uh, Father, thank you for the promise of a Savior that would come. Thank you for that first gospel that we read, even in, the, in Genesis 3. Uh, the promise of a seed of a woman who would come, who would crush the serpent's head. Lord, we thank you for the fulfillment of that in the coming of Christ. He was the seed uh, that was prophesied that would come. Lord, thank you that he did come, and thank you that he did crush Satan's head, that he won the victory in our place. I thank you that he redeemed us and rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light, whom we have forgiveness for the of their forgiveness of sin. Oh, Father, as we uh, turn our hearts and our thoughts towards Christmas, as we celebrate the incarnation, the coming of Christ, uh, Lord, I thank you uh, for all that that means to us. We realize that so much of what happens at Christmas time has become very commercial. But for the true believer, Lord, this is a very special time as we reflect on uh, your mercy and grace to us and the giving of your only son uh, that he would be the sin bearer for us. He would take our sins upon himself so that we could be forgiven and made right with you. Oh, Lord, we rejoice in that, not just at Christmas. We rejoice every day. What a blessing it is to know that we can have a personal relationship with the Lord of the universe. Thank you for the spirit of adoption uh, that you've given to us so that we can cry out, Abba, Father. And Lord, because you're our Father, thank you that we can bring to you all our needs and concerns. Thank you that you care about everything going on in our life. And thank you that you have a plan for everything. And you cause all things to work together for good uh, to those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Father, we have our struggles. We struggle with temptation. We have these trials that come into our life in which we're tempted to act in ways that are uh, displeasing to you. And I pray, Father, that your grace would abound to us or that we might respond more and more in a way that is pleasing to you and glorifies your name. Now, Father, I pray for those who are in the thick of things right now, who are going through some severe trials, physical perhaps, relationship issues, uh, perhaps issues at work. Lord, you know all that we're going through. Thank you that we can rest in you, that we can cast all our care upon you, knowing that you care for us. I thank you that we don't have to be anxious about anything. We don't have to worry. But, Lord, we can do as you told us in your word, uh, that in everything, through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, we can make our requests known to you. The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Oh, Lord, we pray that your peace would rule in our lives, would be the umpire, we pray, Father, that uh, we would uh, just learn to trust you fully in all things, knowing that you are the great I am. Uh, you are all sufficient in every circumstance. Father, today we pray uh, for those around the world who've never had the opportunity to hear uh, the good news of Jesus. Father, we pray that the gospel would go forth in power. We pray for those who have gone out uh, to share this good news. Would you bless and encourage them? Father, we think of Tony and Kendall in Thailand. Pray for them as they uh, have a great desire to make you known to the Thai people. Pray for our brother Boon Chu as he works among the Karen people. Uh, we think of Jamie and Jen as they've gone to Madrid, Spain uh, to share Christ with uh, the Spanish people there. Father, as there are folks all over, we pray for Remember New and uh, for this ministry that is rescuing 
young boys and girls who are in danger of being sold into sex trafficking. Father, the need is great. We pray that you would give us your heart for the world. And Lord, may it begin right where we are. This is our Jerusalem. We pray that you would give us a burden for our neighbors, for our colleagues at work, for friends at school who don't know Jesus. Lord, make us bold as lions and make us loving and kind as possible. Lord, may we share the love of Jesus with people freely, eagerly. Lord, may our hearts overflow with love for you so that it would come out in our speech. Lord, would you use us to draw many to yourself, to introduce many into the kingdom of God. Father, thank you for all that you're doing in our midst. I pray for Crossgate. I pray for this body of believers that you would continue to build up uh, this body of believers. Uh, help us all to grow as true disciples of Jesus. I pray, Father, that you would continue to make the light of Christ shine brighter and brighter through this community of believers. May your name be exalted in our midst. We thank you for all that you will do. I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The order of service is altered just a little bit. I want to sing the special now, but I want to set it up and give you some context. Otherwise, I'm, I'm not sure it'll make as much sense. The passage that Pastor David is preaching from today is, from Jeremiah 29, and we're all familiar with that. I know the plans that I have for you um, to do good. I look forward to Pastor David's teaching on that. But before that, uh, just to set up, it's, it's a letter that Jeremiah has written to the exiles of Jerusalem. So these are people who are not where they're supposed to be or not where they want to be. And yet the Lord tells them, let me with these for a moment. The Lord does tell them in a letter that, uh, that, that uh, Jeremiah sent, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile uh, from Jerusalem to Babylon, build your houses, live in them, plant gardens, eat their produce, take wives, become the fathers of sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give uh, that they may bear. Plant yourself in the land, flourish, as the old saying says, bloom where you're planted. And yet they know that's not their home. Uh, how often do we want and do we have a sense of belonging to a place. Leslie and I have lived here for 20 years. We kind of know Seneca pretty well, and yet it's not really our home. My parents just sold the house of 50 years that I grew up in, and, and 106 Martindale is no longer a Warlick residence. It's not my home. And yet we want that sense of belonging, don't we? And yet the Lord says, well, it's not really quite here yet on earth, I think. Uh, so the promise that he gives us is that he will call us home and as we'll sing this or see this song if you know it please sing along with but um you you may feel like you're homeless i will bring you home um whatever's the matter i will be your home um it, the promise that the lord is working and he is calling us to something um we know what that is though we don't know quite what it's going to look like i think in the final days so uh, i'll be quiet now um this is uh, the, the Lord will bring us home.
When time reaches fullness, when I move my hand, I will bring you home. And home to your own place in a beautiful land, I will What I hope we have that we can sing of such promises, uh, that, that we have a, a home with God and His embrace of our loving Heavenly Father. Uh, we take up that, uh, that theme of hope uh, this morning as we look toward uh, the celebration of, of Christmas. And if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Jeremiah, we'll be looking at Jeremiah 29. Um, we're going to focus on verses uh, 10 through 15. Do 14, but I'll start reading in verse 1 just to give us a little bit of the, the context there. Um, I hope everyone had a, had a great uh, Thanksgiving, a thankfulness uh, for who God is, for what He's done for us. And as, as Thanksgiving is in some ways a sense that we look to the past and see what all God has done and where we stand because of Him. Uh, and as we take up the theme of hope, it's as we look forward. Uh, where we are going uh, because of God's promises, because He is the one uh, who leads us and, and gives us a longing uh, for the fulfillment, the fullness of all that He has promised us in Christ. Uh, so even before we read the passage this morning, would you pray with me for God's blessing on His Word? Well, Lord, we, our God, we do praise You. Uh, we honor You as our Father, and we ask that You would uh, let us see uh, your promises in their fullness, and that you would let us uh, found our life uh, on your word, not merely our, our hopes or dreams or, our, or what we can make for ourselves, uh, but Lord, that it would be your word that, is, that has established the foundation of the world, uh, and so also would be the foundation for our life. Lord, we thank you that we can sing of hope, and that we can sing with longing, uh, but more than that, we thank you that that hope is a surety and a confidence because you and your love have sent Christ your Son into the brokenness of the world that we might have life in them. Lord, we thank you that there is hope uh, for sinners like us. We come to your word this morning, Lord, we ask that you would work through it according to your promises, uh, that we would experience uh, that hope, that we would experience your closeness to us, uh, and the longing for the fullness of it that you have promised in Jesus. Lord, we bring to you our, our hurts, our sorrows, our struggles, our doubts, and ask that you would work through your word uh, to meet us where we are, uh, but to bring us to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Jer Jeremiah chapter 29, I'll begin reading in verse 1. Hear the word of God. A little bit of the context. The these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priest and to the prophets and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah, the queen mother, and the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. 
The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses, live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons, and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams that they dream for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. Focus on these verses. For thus says the Lord, When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to me, back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart, and I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the places from which I sent you into exile. Grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord is forever. And so for us this morning. The celebration of Christ's uh, birth is always a celebration of hope, hope that comes in unexpected ways and unexpected times, but a celebration of hope, right, that, that God would come as a baby, uh, born, uh, born in a manger, or that the long hoped for Messiah, the King and Savior of the world that had been uh, prophesied would, would come during a time of, of Roman occupation of the greatest secular ruler and secular power uh, in that days, right? As we read that Christmas story in the days of Caesar Augustus, uh, that Christ was born. It's a celebration of hope, though, of hope that comes uh, from God, that comes from God to us as a light uh, shining in the darkness, a new birth, a new way, a new means of victory uh, in Christ. I think we always have a a tendency to give up hope, or to give up on hope, to stop looking uh, toward the future, or at least stop looking toward the future so, uh, so expectantly. We easily get uh, discouraged, especially in difficult times, uh, or maybe just in difficult times of the year, hard circumstances. It's easy to, to lose sight of hope, of what we're living for, of what we long for, where things are going. But the gospel always brings it back into focus always brings hope and a clarity uh, for us because of what God has done. So it's a celebration of hope. We take up this passage in Jeremiah, and he speaks of this, this future and a hope, but I'll admit, uh, Jeremiah, this is not a Christmas passage uh, exactly. It's not a Christmas passage, but Jeremiah speaks of that uh, hope, the hope that we need, uh, the hope that ultimately is only found uh, through Jesus. Uh, Jesus, who was born as the Savior of the world uh, for us, there is our hope. As you begin your uh, Christmas shopping or your Christmas decorating, uh, or as you start to hear more and more of just Christmas music around, I uh, hear these words as well, and let it be a time that reminds you that there really is hope. That there really is hope for you. There is hope for us. Uh, there is hope for the world. Because God has given his son for us, moves all things toward him. There's a hope uh, that comes uh, from God. Look at three sides of the passage, uh, the need for hope, uh, the reasons for hope, and then lastly, the actions uh, for hope. 
You think of the, uh, the words of the, the hymn, I long lay the world in sin and error pining. Brings about that, that need uh, for hope uh, that we speak of, I hear, expresses that need of hope that we see in this passage. Now, how much you know of uh, Israel's history or, or Jeremiah's history, but if there was ever a time uh, that folks might be losing hope, uh, it might have been during the time of, of Jeremiah the prophet. He wasn't known for, for bringing a lot of good news and rejoicing. Uh, sometimes talked about as the, as the weeping uh, prophet. Jeremiah brought a lot of bad news to God's people. Uh, over and over again, calling them out in their sin and bringing bad news to God people, to people who, who usually weren't listening uh, to what God said uh, and, and continued to ignore it. No, these are the people who were supposed to do right, who knew what was right, and were supposed to be uh, living that out, and instead they turned uh, to wickedness throughout their country, uh, throughout the land, uh, given over to it. And no matter how much or how often, the Lord called them back. No matter how much through Jeremiah and other prophets God called them to repentance and called them to come back to himself, they continued to ignore him. God was bringing about uh, their judgment. And in fact, already uh, in this passage in Jeremiah 29, as he writes this letter to the exiles, already Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has come and, and taken them over, has, uh, has, has conquered Judah, has sacked God's holy temple taken away some of the items uh, from the temple, has taken away uh, the line of David, the, the king, uh, Jeconiah, has been taken away uh, into exile, into Babylon, along with many others uh, with him. And so here in these verses, from those that are still in Jerusalem, uh, Jeremiah writes this letter to these exiles that have been taken away from their home and are in Babylon. It would have been some like uh, Daniel uh, from the Bible, or Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his, his companions, uh, uh, his, his writing to them as they've been taken away uh, from uh, their homeland. As you read these verses, you hear the need for hope, don't you? You hear the brokenness of their experience. You hear how difficult the world is for them. It's not the way it's supposed to be. They're not where they belong. They're, the world's not going the way that it's supposed to go, it would feel like. You hear how much of the brokenness, even just looking down at verse 14, uh, you can hear that, they have, uh, that their fortunes have been lost, uh, that they have been uh, scattered, that they've been separated uh, from one another uh, and scattered abroad into places that they did not want to go. Uh, and all of that because they have been driven out by God. They've been driven into exile uh, from uh, their own God because of what they have done. All right, how would you feel uh, in that circumstance? Would you have a lot of hope? Or, or how would you feel if you couldn't access, uh, your, you couldn't get to your possessions anymore? Uh, they've been taken away from you. Are you taken away from them? Uh, if you couldn't access your bank account uh, anymore, you just couldn't go home. Couldn't be with the people uh, that you love, that you know, and that know you, dragged away to a place that you didn't want to be in, to a culture that's not only unfamiliar and unknown to you and speaks a different language, but also has different values, worships a different God, uh, different gods, and brings all of that into it. You can imagine how difficult that would be. And that you couldn't act like things were just okay. You couldn't even act like things were okay between uh, you and God because you knew that you had been taken into exile because God was judging your country, judging your people, so that that was why uh, you were there. Well, it's your need for hope. Uh, and the way that Jeremiah speaks to them here, and, and, and you hear the, the difficulty of them, because Jeremiah essentially tells them, I uh, hear you're in exile, and hey, listen, not coming home anytime soon. That's the 70 years, right? Uh, when 70 years are completed in Babylon. Now, there's, there's hope that he gets to from this, but I want you to feel this first. Uh, if you're there uh, in Babylon and you hear when 70 years are completed, that's a long time. Do them have, right? I mean, with some of us, we could say, how, how would you feel if I said, hey, things are, you know, things are difficult now here in 2021? I know life's been hard in 2019 and 2020 and still hard here in 21, but, but listen, listen, 
uh, by, by year 2091, things are going to turn around. There's going to be something good that comes. The different things, a different way of happening is going to come, right? You can kind of do the math and you go, well, for some of the elementary schoolers in the room, there, there's some good things there. Uh, but for most of us, that's going to be past our time. And hear the, the difficulty of it. But even so, Jeremiah tells them as there's that need for hope to hold on to that hope, to still recognize as God's promises there in what they were experiencing, but also what God is leading it to, uh, what the future holds for them. Even in the middle of the consequences of pain and of, of sin and error, uh, there is hope. Right, and Jeremiah is clear uh, throughout, uh, throughout his, his ministry, and, and scriptures are very clear about hope, that hope is not the, the denial of difficulty. We're prone to that uh, sometimes. It's not the denial of difficulty or the denial of hardship. It's not, it's not pretending that things are just okay. Or pretending that, well, I'm sure they'll, I'm sure they'll work out eventually. And in fact, one of the big sins that Jeremiah calls out against uh, Zedekiah, against the pro- false prophets, against uh, God's people in that time was just pretending that things were okay. When really they were ignoring God. When really whatever prosperity they had was still going away opposite from what God had told them. Living uh, to, to other gods and in a false religiosity instead of a sincerity pretending that things are okay when they were not. And so God gets their attention uh, through this judgment. Listen, when we come to to Christmas, the message hasn't sounded particularly hopeful yet. I don't want you to take on uh, that hope. But listen, that when we come to to Christmas, it's not simply because everything is going along so wonderfully. And our hope doesn't just depend upon what the present circumstances feel like. And listen, we can sing all day long. I love, too, the, the songs. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Right? But let's still recognize the need that we have for hope that comes uh, from God. And it's not that we celebrate Christmas because everything is just so wonderful here. Uh, because everything is so great and we listen to Christmas music and we spread Christmas cheer and there's good, uh, good vibes and there's happiness and snowflakes that just make this such a great place to be that that's why God looked down and said, you know what, I'm going to send my son there. You know, Jesus is going to come and be born there because everything is just so wonderful here, right? Not not at all. But into the brokenness, into the brokenness and the hardship and the difficulty and the sin piled up upon sin, God was willing there to come to us in order that in that pain and sin and sorrow, there might be hope because our God has come to us to give us a future and a hope. You might look and say with this letter of Jeremiah, well, well that was then and this is now, right? We're not in Babylon. Uh, we're, we're not exiles uh, somewhere. For some of you, this is where you grew up. Or you moved here voluntarily. You weren't, you weren't dragged here. We're not in exiles. And, that's it. and it's not the year of what it would it be, maybe 591 B.C. This is 2021 A.D., right? How do, how do we look at this now? But still, I think all of Scripture, and this passage included, would lead us to, to enter into that theme of, of exile. We saw that in 1 Peter says. You see it in the beginning of Scripture. It doesn't take very long as you open up the Bible before you realize that humanity is in exile. Right? By Genesis chapter 3, already uh, Adam and Eve get, get kicked out of paradise. They're driven away Uh, from from paradise, away from the garden, away from intimacy with God, fellowship with Him because of the brokenness of sin, because of what has been done. And they need some way to be able to be restored uh, to to that purpose, restored to to fellowship with God. And they're told that there will be a child that will be the seed of the woman. Uh, The offspring of the woman will be born and he that will be uh, that Savior. So we continue looking at that hope uh, for exile, or even just individually in our own, uh, in our own lives, and our own sins. We need some way to be made right when we mess up so often. We see the hold that pride has on our hearts, or discouragement has uh, on our hearts. Uh, we experience the brokenness of ourselves, the brokenness of the world around us, uh, and broken relationship with God. And we realize that, that we can't just fix it. 
We can't just pretend it's okay or make it okay uh, from ourselves, and yet there's hope. There's hope because God is the one who gives that hope. There's hope uh, because of Christmas. There's hope because God has sent his son uh, into the world for us to bring us out of exile. As soon as we start saying uh, because, there's hope because, we're speaking of those reasons uh, for hope, secondly. Right, there's a ground for it. There's reasons for the hope. Or as the uh, hymn continues on, long lay the world in sin and error pining until, until he appeared soul uh, felt its worth, and that him uh, gets it right for us. It is, it is God's appearing. It's God's uh, coming uh, to us, his advent, his coming to us that brings us a uh, hope. It's where hope comes from. Right? The reason uh, for hope is that God cares about us. He loves us and has given himself for us that we can, we can see from history now. How much we matter to God. So love the world that he sent his only begotten son. We might have life in him. That we might not perish but have life uh, in him. There's a reason uh, for hope that comes uh, from God's care for us. Not only does God know our struggles, not only does God know our plight, but as Jeremiah reminds us here, uh, God knows uh, his plan. He knows the plan that he has for us. Where it leads, how the marvelous story that it leads to of salvation and that he will bring it about. Right, to put it plainly, if we ask, what's, what is our hope or what is the hope of this passage? That God doesn't leave us in our sin. That God doesn't leave us in exile. He doesn't leave us away from him. He draws us to himself. It's the reason for the hope of Christmas. You notice uh, how many times in this passage as you read it that God says, I will, right? Not just what we will do, but he speaks so much here about what what he will do. I will, I will. Because the the reason for hope, uh, for real grounded to biblical hope is not what we've done from ourselves, but what, what God has done for us and who he is, right? He says, I will visit you. I will visit you. I will come to you. I will fulfill my promise to you. You're in a foreign land and you're hurting under that and you hear God saying, I will fulfill my promise to you. There's hope. I will bring you back uh, to this place. And where does their hope uh, come from? Uh, From the Lord who made heaven and earth. The covenant uh, promises of God are not defunct. Uh, They're not canceled. They're not invalidated. They can't be. And God reminds them again, I will fulfill them. Right, The way that we're always afraid of of our sins being too much, of being too much to be forgiven of, too much uh, for God uh, to handle, too much to be dealt with. The way we start to think that our situation is, is too hard or too difficult, or too impossible to, to turn it around and to make it into, into something better. And yet God says, I will. I will visit you. I will deal with it. He goes on to say in verse 12, I will hear. I will hear when you call me. I, I will be found by you. He goes on in verse 14, I will restore Your fortunes, the things that have been lost, I will restore uh, to you. I will gather you from all the nations and places where it felt like you were were spread out since you would never more be together or have a home, and he will bring them uh, back, bring them back from the place to which which he had sent them. God doesn't leave us in exile. Uh, We're not stuck out of relationship with God, just as if there's no hope, uh, because he is a God who restores. 2 Corinthians 5 puts it this way, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Our God is a God who reconciles, who draws back into relationship with him. Ah, this is the joy of our hope. This is what we celebrate in Christmas. This is, when we can, this is the hope of why we can sing a psalm like Psalm 130. And a psalm of confession, because one of the most hopeful things that you can do is admit your sin. 
Uh, admit how much you have fallen aside because in doing so, you're saying you're not your hope, but who God is in his forgiveness, that there is a reason for confidence. We have a God who reconciles, uh, who forgives, and who makes these promises uh, to us. Right, isn't this the hope of Christmas? Not that, not that we have loved God, but that he has first loved us. So we hope in him. J.C. Ryle has put it this way, Christ's uh, love toward us and not our love toward Christ is the true ground of expectation and the true foundation of our hope. Just how much we're feeling it at the moment, but what God has done for us is where our feelings draw uh, their well from. As Jeremiah uh, puts it, he says, I, uh, God says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. We so often or so easily get discouraged or start to, to lose hope. Uh, there's a lot of different situations, but I think it's helpful to ask, what's, what's the why behind that? What's the why behind why we start, start to, to lose hope? And I think this passage speaks into it. And a lot of times that we look at our situation, we just feel like, I don't know what's going on. This isn't the way that I thought things were going. This isn't the way that I wanted things to go. I don't, I don't know what's happening here. Uh, and is it enough, though, that God knows the plan that he has for us? that he's able to bring it about. We don't always know, but it's not just accidental. It's not without purpose. God is bringing about uh, his good purposes. And that sometimes we start to lose discouragement because it not only feels like we don't know what's going on, but because things are, things are going badly, uh, because we're hurt within it, right? That it feels like everything is going wrong. Uh, but can it be enough for us to realize that God says that he is working uh, for your good, not for evil. He is working out his plans toward our welfare in Christ. That he has opened up this way of forgiveness for us in him. And as we come to him through Christ, uh, his plan is for our benefit. We can look in that, no matter all the difficult things that we go through. Or sometimes we just look and we say, I don't know what all to make of it. Or I can't, it feels like I can't make the future what I want it to be. That I've tried again and again and things keep falling apart and I don't know that I can can turn it around. Instead, can it be enough? Are you willing for God to give you a hope? He says here, "Ah, for I will give to you a future and a hope. Jeremiah didn't know the fullness of that plan, though he prophesied about it, though he prophesied of this uh, righteous branch that would come from the line of David, right? He didn't realize just how amazing God's plans were uh, for our salvation, that God himself would come in the flesh uh, for us. He didn't uh, didn't realize how amazing God's plans for our welfare uh, would be. Uh, Though he prophesied God's promise that I will remember their sins no more. So much more than an earthly return to Jerusalem or simply a rebuilding of a physical temple, uh, but the new covenant, the new covenant that Jeremiah speaks of, the new co- same new covenant that Jesus speaks of as the new covenant in my blood, uh, where they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, Jeremiah says. And Jeremiah, as he prophesied, didn't see all that would yet be involved in that future and hope, though he prophesied about that day. As, as Jeremiah puts it, uh, behold, the days are coming, uh, declares the Lord. Over and over he says this, behold, the days are coming, uh, declares the Lord. The days are coming. And that is our hope. Not just our circumstances or what we can do from it, but God is the one who gives a future and a hope. And that hope is the gift of God. It has come in its greatest uh, fullness in the person of Jesus Christ. So how do we respond uh, to that hope? See, the need uh, for hope, the, uh, the, the reasons for hope, but the passage also mentions the actions of hope. We're to be, we're to be hopeful uh, within it. We're to respond in that way. The hymn goes, Long lay the world in sin and error pining until uh, he appeared and the soul felt its worth. And then that next line, a thrill of hope, a thrill of hope, the weary world uh, rejoices. 
as you take these exiles in Babylon, as they hear that God says, I will fulfill my promises, they say, that's the word I need to hear. That's what lets me hold on to life for myself, for my kids, for my grandchildren, for the future, uh, for God's promises and welfare. That When 70 years comes for most of us, I can tell you this, if your faith is in Christ, things will be a lot better. Uh, your experience will be better. You will be with the Lord and at home with Him. Uh, there is hope in that. Not what we can make, but what God gives because He's given us His Son. A thrill of hope. So we understand what God has done. Doesn't it, doesn't it thrill? Uh, doesn't it cause us to rejoice when we love uh, to sing some of these songs that we sing uh, together? That doesn't mean the sorrow is not there. But the hope speaks even from within the sorrow. Uh, William Gurnall has said it this way, Hope fills the afflicted soul. Hope fills the afflicted soul with such inward joy and consolation that it can laugh while tears are in the eye. Sigh and sing all in a breath. It's called uh, the rejoicing of hope in Hebrews. The rejoicing of hope. We have a God that doesn't leave us weary and worn out. It's like not a lot of people are hopeful uh, lately. Uh, but if our ground is here, if our response is to what God has done, He doesn't leave us simply weary and worn out. Uh, he calls us to respond uh, to Him with the actions of hope because He has come to Him. I mentioned all those things in the passages where it says, I will, I will. God says, I will restore. I will bring you back. You notice God tells us also some of what we'll do. Or he tells those exiles what they'll do and how and our response should be likewise. And he says, you will. Verses 12 and 13. Right? Uh, he says, you, then you will call upon me. You will come and you will pray to me. And you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. If we have hope because of what God has done for us in Christ, then what do we do? I simply put, we, we go to God. If He has opened us a way for us to come to Him, then we run back to Him and we come to Him in repentance and we come to Him uh, in sorrow and in difficulty and we hope in Him. But we come uh, to God and cast all our cares upon Him. If we hope in God, we seek after Him in everything that we do. Not simply the devotional time, they're not simply Sunday morning, and all of how we live is a seeking after God and His purposes, His plans that He's able to bring about. We come uh, to Him, we call upon Him, we pray to Him, as we know that we're heard, and we know the way that He answers in Christ. You will seek after me and find me, He says, seek after me with all your heart. We're not to despair of there uh, being no hope for us now. Well, things are just going, going the wrong direction, and so we can see how this is all going to work out. We're not, we're not to live as, as if there's not hope. We're not to uh, live in discouragement or live in denial, just pretending that, uh, that we can make it all right, or that, well, thing, things will be okay, or this is really is actually good, or what we're supposed to, supposed to be like. Um, we're to trust God with our aches and sorrows. Uh, with our sins and our failures, with our, with our errors and our hardships, even as we see the evil around us, because He is the one who's able to deliver. He is the rescuer, the Savior of the world. He's promised to do so. He's the one who's able to, to work in the middle of it uh, and continues to draw people to Himself, to change hearts, to change lives, uh, to convert and bring out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Turning, turning back in repentance is possible because of God's plans, because of His promises. And so He says uh, uh, to these exiles, come back to me in your hearts. I will be bringing you back and filling these promises. That hope, of, uh, hope for repentance, right? Uh, so, so sinners, when you get to hear about repentance, uh, you rejoice. You say, wait, I can admit these things and be, and be cleansed from us? I can have been separated from God but acknowledge how far off what I have been is and be drawn back into his arms? It's like that story of the prodigal son. 
who had turned away uh, from his father and gone his own ways. But as he comes uh, back, owning his sin and owning that repentance, his father is, is running toward him. Here is our God, a reconciling God uh, who calls us to himself. And as we are wrapped in his arms, we, we call him Father. Uh, we speak to him as the one who has provided for our salvation, to live for him, to seek after him with all our heart. Part of what got me in looking over this passage is to say, seeking after God with all of your heart. I think sometimes I just want to hold part of my heart back. And I realize the lack of trust that's involved in it. That's what you see when, there's, when, there, when you're not as hopeful as you, as you feel like you ought to be or as Scripture calls us to be. Like, well, I don't really know how God's going to work it all out yet. I'll, I'll hold that part back from when I see what really happens. As if His Word isn't enough for it to be true. To seek after God with all of our hearts, giving all, not, not kind of hedging our bets over here that we're also investing in our own safety just in case it doesn't work out, as if there's any other hope for it. Not, not also seeking after our own satisfaction or our own security or just uh, seeking our self-fulfillment, but seeking after God with all of our heart until what we give our whole heart uh, to, how that hope comes from. Jesus has come. Jesus has come. Jesus was born here, and he lived, and he suffered, and he died, but was raised from the dead so that there is confidence of hope for sinners to put all their investment in him, for sinners to give up all their other ways of living and all their other faith and hope and say, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want him to be the Lord of my life. I want the future that he gives and not what I can make for myself. I want to live as his servant. The way has been open for us to come uh, to God. And so let us hold fast our hope without wavering, Hebrews says. For he who promised is faithful. Let the hope of the gospel uh, thrill you and thrill you into rejoicing and even rejoicing and repenting and coming and calling out to the Lord. The actions of a hopeful life I live for him. I let the hope of the gospel thrill you as the hymn goes, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Jeremiah puts it, uh, for his mercies are new every morning. New every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Read in the early chapters of Matthew, you do have in that extended Christmas story or that time around Christ's birth that Matthew quotes Jeremiah. Uh, Matthew 2 quotes Jeremiah the prophet as, as Herod, uh, not in a hopeful circumstance, you might, it might seem like, uh, but he quotes Jeremiah 2 uh, as Herod has had all the children, the male children two years old and under in Bethlehem slaughtered. Uh, because he's wanting to slaughter whoever that, whoever that Messiah child might be. And, and so there, he has them all killed. Uh, and it quotes, uh, it quotes from, um, sorry, it quotes from uh, Jeremiah 31. Uh, that there, Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah. Lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Quotes there in Matthew, but Jeremiah goes on. He says, Thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work, declares the Lord. And they, your children, shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord. In the voice of the Lord, by the word of the Lord that grounds our hope, that gives us that confidence. He says, I will give you a future and a hope. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord. Let us pray. Oh Lord our God, how good are your gifts to us and how gracious and free is your mercy uh, poured out abundantly. Uh, your love that you would send uh, your son, that you would take rebels like us. Uh, who have tried to offer what we have to other gods or other ways of living instead of you, and you would capture our hearts again. Oh, Lord, fix our heart upon you. Draw out the fullness of our heart and the fullness of our faith that we might not look to anything else. 
And Lord, as we celebrate uh, this Christmas, let it be with the acknowledgement of all of the brokenness and the joy that you have brought salvation out of that brokenness. For you have given us your son. Oh Lord, ground us in your hope and let us long for your return. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand as we close. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' perfect life, death, and resurrection. And so aren't we thankful for the foundation uh, that we have of Christ, uh, Christ coming up for us? I want you to know uh, that hope. And if you feel the discouragement and you'd like to talk more uh, with Tom or me about that hope, about who Christ is for us, we would love, uh, love for you to stop us, love to be able to talk with you more. Uh, but as, you, uh, as you're here gathered in Christ's name, as the people of God, then go out with God's blessing on you toward that hope. Uh, receive the Lord's benediction. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all now and forever. Amen.